The Fermi Paradox. Part 8. Rare Earth. Or not. A privileged planet? Perhaps the best known argument for the uniqueness of humanity is the so called Rare Earth Hypothesis. First proposed by paleontologists Peter Ward and Donald Brownlee in their 2000 book Rare Earth Why Complex Life is Uncommon in the Universe. In it, they outline what they believe to be a long series of necessary events for intelligent life to have emerged on our planet. The arguments of Rare Earth have been surprisingly influential, and many have become common knowledge among the astro literate. However, many of its suppositions have been called into question by later research. The hypothesis' central contention is that Earth owes the rise of megafauna and complex ecosystems on its surface to a freakish series of attributes and events that, taken together, are too unlikely to have occurred elsewhere. Despite the claims of some science fiction writers, and even some science documentaries, there is nothing insignificant or little about our blue-green planet. In fact, it is the largest solid object in our solar system, and also the only one with active plate tectonics. While other worlds in our solar system, such as the outer moons Io and Triton, are known to be geologically active, with erupting volcanoes and geysers, only Earth has its crust broken up into a set of mobile plates that pull apart and crash together, raising up mountains and breaking apart continents. Earth is also the only terrestrial planet with a large moon. While the moons of the outer gas giants may exceed ours in size, they are tiny in comparison to their parent planets. Our moon, by contrast, is a relative monster, fully 181st of Earth's volume. And while Saturn's moon Titan may have finally ended Earth's unique position as the only known world with open bodies of liquid on its surface, the sparse, scattered methane lakes on Titan are nothing compared to the ocean of liquid water that floods our planet to depths of thousands of meters. The rare earth hypothesis contends that Earth's large sides aids us in several ways. First, it is large enough to retain a substantial atmosphere. This may seem self-evident at first, given that we need air to breathe, but life need not be oxygen-dependent. Far more important is that it maintains a pressure great enough for liquid water to remain on its surface. If our atmosphere were substantially thinner, our oceans would boil away, just as they have on Mars. Our atmosphere also keeps us warm. Mars would be a relatively temperate world, despite its farther distance from the sun, if its atmosphere were like ours. A second way our planet's relatively large mass helps us is that it aids in the retention of a magnetic field. Earth's iron core is still liquid, and a spinning subsurface ocean of liquid iron generates a rotating magnetic field that deflects high-energy particles. This magnetic field acts like a force field, protecting us from the worst effects of our sun. The solar wind, a flow of charged matter flowing outward from the sun at millions of kilometers per hour, is held at bay by Earth's magnetic field. If we didn't have it, life on Earth's surface would be impossible, as we would be constantly bombarded with ultraviolet rays and plasma from solar storms. Over time, this bombardment would strip away our atmosphere, and leave Earth dead. Mars, again, is living, or dead, proof of this. Smaller planets gradually lose internal heat to space, just as smaller cups of tea cool faster than larger ones. This leads their inner cores to solidify, and for any magnetic fields they may have once had, to shut down. Another argument is that Earth's plate tectonics provide a crucial benefit for life by aiding in the development of biodiversity. Continent shift location entering new climatic zones, and changing their biogeography as they travel. They also split apart, taking their cargo of living creatures with them, and isolating them from other breeding populations, thus creating new and odd species, as Australia shows today. Conversely, they also merge together, creating great biological interchanges between their populations, such as that which occurred four million years ago when the North and South American continents were merged by the rising Isthmus of Panama. When continents collide, they often rise up fold mountains such as the Himalayas, or volcanic chains like the Andes, creating natural barriers that prevent species from interacting. A hypothesis currently gaining strength is that Earth's oceans may have played a role in its developing plate tectonics. 
Hydrated rock is more malleable and less brittle than dehydrated rock, and water seeping into the magma of the upper mantle would have decreased its viscosity, making it more fluid and easier for the continents to slide across. Some even argue that water was necessary for plate tectonics to begin in the first place, since it would have weakened Earth's crust sufficiently to break apart. While evidence for this hypothesis has so far come mainly from simulations, the planet Venus is argued to be an example of the alternate scenario. Only slightly smaller than Earth, Venus is, in all other respects, its monstrous reflection. Its atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide, and 90 times the pressure on Earth. This creates a gargantuan greenhouse effect on the surface, which raises the temperature above 460 degrees Celsius, hot enough to melt lead. Observations by the Magellan spacecraft in 1991 suggest that, unlike Earth, Venus's crust is not divided into tectonic plates, but instead is a single, thick rind. Simulations of Venus's atmosphere on Earth suggest that the only way its volcanoes could withstand the pressure cooker environment intact is if they were utterly devoid of water, down to the molecular level. It is now believed that Venus's proximity to the Sun meant that any water it may have had boiled away early in its evolution, leaving it bone dry. Other scientists have argued that the rare Earth hypothesis overplays the importance of plate tectonics as a driver of biodiversity. Chris McKay, a planetary scientist at NASA, has suggested that plate tectonics may have actually impeded the development of intelligent life on Earth by thrusting up heavy metals like iron from the depths of the Earth onto the surface. The presence of iron in the primordial ocean meant that much of the earliest oxygen produced by the first photosynthetic microbes combined with the iron before it could enter the atmosphere, creating bands of iron oxide still visible today. If that oxygen had instead escaped into the air, McKay estimates that life on Earth could have proceeded from microbes to intelligence in as little as a hundred million years. And plate tectonics may not be as rare as we think. A 2007 study by paleontologists at Harvard suggested that Earth may actually be on the marginal end for plate tectonics, and that planets larger than Earth would be more tectonically active, since they would have far more intense convection and far thinner plates. Even the crucial issue of water would be less relevant, as the sheer brute force of these mammoth planets' geology took over. But it is not just our planet that rare Earth contends makes life on Earth unique. Our moon plays a role as well, and we will be examining that role in the next episode.